What I want to do is just give an, a brief introduction to the school of school years attachment and school years in general, and then talk a bit about uh, show some DMM studies. And I think it's probably got most of them that have been published using the SAA and some of my story stem stuff. And I also want to dip into developmental trauma because I think the DMM has got a real contribution to make um, on the subject of um, child maltreatment DMM. Um, developmental trauma in school years children. So attachment in the school years. Um, once you go to school, the world changes dramatically. All communities, all societies um, send children around five or six or seven, depends where you are, seven years or so, out of home, or at least they send them to other people to learn something. And in attachment terms, the availability of attachment figures um, takes over from proximity. So in the under fives, you need the physical presence of attachment figures. As you get into the school years, uh, increasingly you have to become more self-reliant. And the school system, of course, is devised so that uh, you have a close relationship with your primary school teacher. And then as you go through the school years, you get more independence. I think there's a question about whether attachment is actually an imperative for this age group. Ideally, of course, attachment should have happened by the time the school years come. So exploration and other things are, um, are taking over. And it does ask questions in particular about adoption, uh, where people, adoptive parents, um, adopt older children. And nowadays in the UK, this can be as old as six, seven, eight, nine even. It's also interesting, I think, to ask the question, I don't know what the answer is, about a latency period. Um, Freud, of course, famous for latency, but does attachment change much? Does attachment, do strategies change much during um, the school years? Having worked with a lot of school age kids, I do wonder sometimes, getting eight and nine year old children um, whose lives have gone into a bit of a mess, it's actually quite difficult sometimes to affect change. In terms of procedures, if you look across the, the field generally, I'm not talking about the DMM now, I'm talking about attachment in general. Um, people say there's no real agreed procedure for assessing attachment. I don't think that's true, actually. I think uh, the SAA um, interviews, story stems, perhaps for younger school age kids, um, work just fine. I think the problem in assessment is later. I think it comes at puberty to about 15. I still think we're... 15, 16, I still thought, I thought think we're looking for um, the right procedures for that. Source memory is a big issue now. So around about six to seven, you can start to trust your own judgment, if you like, rather being dependent on adults to scaffold your memories and your views of things. Um, you can take your own view. For example, if your mother tells tells you that her new boyfriend is just a friend, and but you know that they sleep together, you can work that one out um, that you've been lied to. In the DMM in particular, deception is an issue. So this is for the C56 group. Um, deception now becomes a feature of, or a, 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 an increasing strategy in the school years, which wasn't there before. Peer group, best friends are also important. Um, in fact, I always think that, you know, if a child's got an attachment figure, at least one person batting for them, and they've got at least one friend, then you're not going to have to worry so much about them. Pets are important. Pets can be substitute attachment figures for some unhappy children. But in particular, they are part of relationships in which the child can both nurture and also control their issues, taking a big dog for a walk or riding a horse. These are now uh, areas in which school-aged children can practice skills. Erickson talked about industry and inferiority, or versus inferiority. You're there to learn. Um, and if you're not learning and if you're not making it, then you start to feel different. I think it's in the school years in particular that children who have troubles really start to feel 
uh, different to other kids. Playing with danger is actually an important part of the school years. Um, a lot of children's games are around forcing uh, the, the envelope just enough to see how you can cope with tricky situations physically to begin with. Um, I think a lot of that may well have changed um, what with the internet and the reluctance of adults to let children out play on their own. You get problems if you're not like other kids physically. I've often noticed too tall, too small can be a real problem for children. Or if you can't regulate your stuff, by the time you get to six, seven, eight, and you're the special needs kid who can't sit down, who doesn't follow instructions, you stop learning as much as the other children and you really become aware that you're different, that actually that they're beginning to leave you behind. Racism, of course, is a big issue for some children in some communities. Social media is an increasing issue. It's gonna be a crucial issue for the adolescents, but it's still an issue for the school years. Um, sexuality, I'm gonna bring up sex a bit later on because it's interesting, I think, that this is a no-no subject, really, in terms of study. Nobody talks about sexuality in kids much these days. Although the world that they live in is increasingly sexualized, but more of that later. So here are some DMM studies. I've got my eye on the clock. I'll try not to go on too long. Give this another 25 minutes. This is one of the uh, Kasia Kruszlowska and colleagues. Some very, very good work, impressive work. Um, looking at um, using the SAA and the TAAI for the SAA is the picture prompt um, procedure, show the child a picture, ask them to tell a story, a made up one and has it happened to you? And the TAAI is an interview based on the adult attachment interview. Um, children with medically unexplained symptoms, the important bits here I think are type A, you've got 34%, type C, um, no, 50, 57 type A, sorry, compulsives and 19, 34% Cs. What's this saying is that this is not a homogeneous group. This comes up quite a lot in her work, that although medical diagnoses tend to lump kids together, when you look at them uh, through a DMM lens, you see that there are different strands to them. Um, 64% uh, showed unresolved loss or trauma. Um, lack of resolution with regard to parental separation and parental conflict. So that indicates that this population with medically unexplained symptoms, you were, and what actually Kasia did a lot of was looking into the family system, secrets in the family and so forth. Um, <clears throat> this is conversion disorders. Again, note, you've got quite a lot of uh, compulsives the majority group, but also type C and a few AC. Um, again, this is a, the important part here is that it's they're not a homogeneous group. Um, behavior problems, when we're looking at ICD-11 ICD now or DSM-5 diagnoses, there are not that many correlations, but actually this was a correlation between type C and behavior problems in this population, which is kind of perhaps to be expected, but also interesting. Um, prematurely born children. Um, the significant one there was 50% um, um, C. Plus. So these were prematurely born kids compared using the SAA when they were in the school years with um, full term children. Um, the one that the, the statistic that stuck out there was the high number of type C's. And if you look at the bottom paragraph there, um, family related uh, traumas and the prim in the um, control group, but the prematurely born reporting more illness related events. <clears throat> the more I do this, the more I think the use of the modifiers and the traumas in the DMM is a real strength that, um, as you can see here, it, it gives you the kind of information that you really want to know, uh, rather than just about strategy. Um, this is Carl Hopkins and Al, um, essay with family drawings. In fact, if you just read that, I won't read right through, but if you read it when I'm talking about it. 
Yeah, well, it wasn't too bad. I thought the family drawings did quite well out of that, actually. Um, they did better on, on risk, no risk, but the, the use of drawings there, I thought was quite, um, quite impressive compared to the SAA as well. This, I think, is the same. Uh, Rebecca's here, so she can correct me if I made an error later on. The interesting statistic there, I think, is the high, in fact, it seems the total number, the red bar in the middle there, um, of children in child protection come out as A3+. Plus. And this is going to come up in other studies. If you look at children who are in the child protection system, this seems to be increasingly a very common pattern, suggesting um, that the room, room for manoeuvre in child protection, things are getting quite serious and the, uh, the array of strategies starts to diminish. Um, <clears throat> that's the, the same again there. Um, I'll just leave it on long enough so you can have a look at that later on. I don't want to pick up on all of these. Um, Mothers, this is another study, um, Crittenden, Robson, the 2B, Mothers AAI and the SAA at six, six years. What's interesting here is um, you see the AAIs in the left-hand column. You've got, I haven't got the correlation statistics, could produce them if needs be, but um, mums AAIs, A plus, five SAA, A, uh, A pluses and three C pluses. Um, if you go down to C plus AAIs, it's five and five A's, that's a, um, a reversal. Um, Eri Haptomaki in Finland has done very interesting work looking at three generations of, um, of, fa of families over three generations. And the issue here is the, the, the dreaded transmission theory. Um, the idea that the attachments transmitted across generations like some kind of radar. In fact, the DMM studies suggest that there is quite often a reversal over generations, or when you get very troubled populations, um, you're certainly not going to get everybody reproducing the same attachment strategy in the next generation. And I've got some stuff on siblings coming, coming up, which actually makes, makes that even more clear, I think. This is a really interesting study, very topical now. Um, Children with gender dysphoria, this is Kasia Kosowska et al. again, a very, very good body of work that well worth a read. Um, the, you see the DMM wheel there, the black dots um, are, the, are the controls, matched age and sex. The pink dots are birth assigned male, these are boys wanting to be girls, and the blue dots are, are girls wanting to be boys. And it's a nice, well, a, a good peppering across both sides of the model there, with just one who made it into B3, I notice. Um, a few A12s, but um, otherwise, it looks like it's skewed around A34 down to C56 with uh, quite a lot of AC. I think, would we be surprised by this? Probably not, although when we think about this, it's about attachment. Um, and then certainly nowadays, some people might argue that it wouldn't be, have, attachment would have nothing to do with it. But this is certainly a troubled population who were just, uh, I think, compared very similar to the children with our psychological, here we are, yeah, of psychological problems. Um, the, I think there was no real difference between the uh, gender dysmorph uh, dysphoria group and other children with um, psychiatric diagnoses. I put ACEs up at the bottom there, adverse childhood experiences. There's quite a lot of work on this. These ACEs are essentially bad stuff that happens like um, divorce is one of them actually, sexual abuse, physical abuse, neglect, parent in prison. Um, I think also mothers having mums who have babies under the age of 19 is another one. Um, this is an interesting area to look at, and I've been trying to do some work myself in this. It's kind of complicated, partly because of getting accurate data. Um, but you'll notice that certainly there was a correlation here between ACEs and high-risk DMM um, patterns. And in terms of future research, I think this might be useful, although there are caveats to it, which we can discuss. Um, okay, so we're now on to siblings. 
um, SAA and siblings. This was the first study by um, Kasia Kosanowska and um, Bronwyn Elliott. Um, basically, if a sibling is referred for treatment and uh, they're li highly likely to have a, a DMM pattern, it's highly likely that the rest, the, their other sibs will too. This is the point here. And I've also highlighted that the parents of the identified patient children also had high rates of psychopathology. There's been other work on this, um, Landini colleagues, uh, Crittenden as well, I think, um, looking at the attachment strategies of the parents of children ref referred for um, treatment. There is a real issue in the school years of fix the boy syndrome, you know. People send the boy to the clinic to get him sorted out. And most clinicians, I think, would want to have a, a broader lens um, on that one. But quite often the child is sent for treatment and has to carry the, all the other problems in the family. This really just highlights that you need, we need, as we know, a systemic approach to uh, problems for kids in this, in this age group. I did, a, well, I didn't do the work actually. I, other people collected the data and I, um, I analyzed it and wrote this. Um, I think uh, it, uh, interesting about this, it's, I think the next one's probably better. Um, the depression modifier that's near the bottom was significantly more common in the SAAs of children in foster care than foster children. I think it's really important this. Um, I've, I've done a lot of work with foster kids and I think the depression problem for those children is very, very per pervasive actually, even though it may come or go. Uh, unlike previous studies, concordance, that's twins, uh, sorry, siblings having the same pattern, uh, was found in pairs, uh, sibling pairs with the opposite gender. And boys whose mothers had a history of mental illness were significantly more likely than girls to be assessed with the depression modifier. Um, the shared and non-shared environment. Um, in fact, even though and there's been a lot of work on this, um, even though you may have the same parents live in the same house, you don't have the same childhood, and that's true of all kids. But the sibling study, um, really what it showed up was that as things get bad, you get more compulsives, and you get more compulsives in the sibling pairs. Um, I know Crittenden famously has a very good quotation, um, sparking off Tolstoy. Tolstoy written that um, um, all, all unhappy families were the same, and all happy families... Um, we're different, Crittenden points out, actually it's probably the other way around, that um, misery is uniformly constricting. Um, and as particularly when you get into the child protection field, there are the number of strategies and the possibilities available to you shrink. So as things get worse at the bottom there, children in the same family tend to experience more of the same childhood. Uh, that's the concordance data. Um, about half of them, there was no concordance anyway. 30%, uh, however, A36. So that was the point I was just making there. Right, I hope you're still with me. Um, about another 10, 15 minutes. Ah, this is interesting. Um, this is me, uh, some of my stuff from Story Stems. That's what the CAPA is, Child Attachment Play Assessment. The top, uh, the left-hand column there, the top one, adult forensic. These are essentially the adult attachment interviews of maltreating parents. They're not the parents of the children in the studies below. But you see there the distribution of um, AIs. And now underneath that, this is 60 kids who did story stems and they were mainly in foster care or under child protection. Um, and then the bottom uh, level, the bottom row, are 650 children in a, a residential school. They actually were some in foster care, some lived at home, some were adopted actually, but they spent more or less most of the year in the residential school and those stories stems with those. So what's interesting about this, um, high A78s there, high A34s in the community um, maltreated group, which is what uh, Carl Hopkins found and other people have found. Yeah, when you get into child maltreatment, that's a very common pattern. Um, 
you'll notice A8, it's actually A8 there at the bottom left hand, number 32 kids. Um, we code A8 in story stems and we've never got any A7s, but we do find A8s and we have a way of thinking, you know, how to identify them. And what was interesting was that the children, you would predict from DMM theory and what research on adults there is, that as you move through the care system, as you have more placements and particularly residential care would produce more A8 and sure as hell it did in that study. That's a third of the kids going in, uh, we coded as A8. Um, you can then read the rest of the figures on that one. Um, that's the same again. Uh, yeah, there's it's the same stuff there. So that's in the probably slightly clearer form. So you can see A8 on the left there. Um, the and more C's, more C5, 6, bracket 7, 8's in, in the residential school. The residential schools are blue and the community um, child protection services are the green. Um, so they were the high end of the DMM seemed to have the kids in, resi in the residential school, um, which kind of makes sense, actually. In terms of stability, um, there was about, this is the story stems again in the residential school. Um, I don't know how many studies there are in the DMM on stability of attachment over time. This was a two year period. Um, and they were around about um, 64%. We had a lot of can't classify in that study, but they were very hard to get a handle on. 64% of them in the same pattern, um, which compare reasonably favorably with other uh, story stems uh, studies. The issue in stability in the school years generally is a really important question. We don't really know the answer to it. You know, um, What's the likelihood of changing pattern? In the residential school study, they a lot of them move from, into AC after two years. I think partly that was to do with having to cope with living at home and in the school, but it could have been something to do with um, reorganization. I'm not too sure. Um, we used a risk scale, um, giving points to modifiers, trauma and pattern. This is very crude and I'm not totally convinced it worked actually. Um, but anyway, on the data we had, type C was the most resistant to change. Um, followed by A, but uh, in other contexts, the issue of change, I think type C is a much more difficult strategy to work with for clinicians and people in general. Um, the DP modifier correlated with diagnosis of depression. And actually, interestingly enough, there was a, a correlation between anxiety disorder, kids in the school and diagnosed with anxiety disorder and type A plus, I mean, all compulsive. I think it's interesting this, the, it really underlines the point that how anxious compulsive children are, people tend to, I think sometimes people feel, you know, they're a bit more robotic and controlled, but they're not actually, that's, that's for sure. And I think, you know, where, where this goes really is that it does support the idea that attachment uh, is an organised response to danger. Um, when things are going really bad, we expect more modifiers. Um, and I think that study sort of confirms that to some extent. It does have limitations. But, um, um, ooh, I'm not sure I'll go through some of that. I think that uh, that was actually on um, change. It, uh, well, I better now show it to you, but I'll show it to you. Uh, we didn't think there was great improvement using the risk matrix of the scoring on the um, strategy uh, modifier and trauma about 44% um, improved. And you can see the kind of things like, I'm not sure how persuasive that is. No change is more persuasive. Being diagnosed with depression and being on medication and being in type C, no change. And deterioration, uh, you have a lot of ACEs now, a lot of adverse childhood experiences. I think that this kind of approach to research is useful. I do think we can use the DMM to try and get into these kind of areas, but being confident about this, I'm not. And I, I know the staff were they're very disappointed about this and um, felt that some of the kids we felt hadn't made much change they thought had. Okay, I'm gonna, maybe another five minutes. It's very, um, without an audience, I don't really know whether you're even still there, but I assume you are. Um, 
I just wanted to touch on to developmental trauma and then I'll stop. Um, I, I particularly want to bring this up, well, two reasons. One is I'm interested in it and B, or two, I think the DMM has a massive amount to contribute here, which we could develop some important stuff here. Um, developmental trauma is essentially having a childhood of neglect and abuse. So there's no one off bad event like a lot of the PTSD literature um, was originally focused on one off um, traumatic events. Um, <clears throat> Van der Kolk spent a lot of time trying to get developmental trauma into the DSM-5 and it was rejected. It did make it into ICD-11, however, but it's only developed around, it's only for adults and uses the adult literature. There's, as far as I can see, this hasn't been extended to kids and I think the school years really is a good place for us to look and to think about this. I think it's really important actually. I think it's somewhere where the DMM can make a massive impact because um, it, in the trauma um, te the literature and in treatment circles, I think perhaps if people knew more about what the DMM could offer, uh, they might actually pick up, pick it up more. Th those, that's the adult, I won't go right through that, but it's the uh, ICD-11 adult um, definitions. Um, and what we do know, of course, is that people going for treatment, adults, that is, who've had abusive childhoods um, are a significant part of the adult treatment population. I mean, this is just one of many studies. Fonig's work on borderline personality disorder just makes that point. I mean, trying to get diagnoses when people have had such terrible childhoods, um, you know, it's problematic, but... Um, the the point here is that it needs uh, uh, it needs picking up in the school years and it needs treating. Otherwise, we just have people who have rotten lives and in adulthood are still in long term treatment for it. And we've got the tools, yeah. You know, we've got the strategy. We've got unresolved trauma, uh, ways of looking at that, and we've got modifiers. And this, I think, is a very good way of looking at developmental trauma as it develops in the school years. And I think we can make a lot of contribution with that. Um, I'll just the last two slides, I think this will do. Um, it seems to me that compulsives are defending themselves by trying to ward off attack, really. And, in, you know, we Subprotective strategies involve hiding, numbing, avoiding, placating powerful people. Children of the compulsive children can't co-regulate. In other words, they are unable to use adults when they are losing self-regulation. So they can't make use of the teacher or substitute attachment figure. And when it fails, of course, they flip into intrusions of forbidden negative affect. And once they're in it, then they're hard to calm down. Um, and I think adults often misread children's struggle to regulate as, um, as defiant behaviour. And then it leaves, it just increases the shame of the child. The, the residential school study where we had films of the kids doing the story stems. Um, it was just so interesting that the, the children had the, in compulsive, using compulsive strategies would often signal to the interviewer, I don't want to go on with this. Can we stop, please? How many more have we got? Very polite about it trying to negotiate their way out. But when that didn't work, you could see them getting more and more agitated. And their arousal, because this was an extreme population of kids, they, it went literally from lying down on the floor or head on arms on table to standing up and walking about and shouting. Um, and if adults miss the cues, if you don't tune in to when the child is losing regulation, you then end up in a struggle with the child. And of course, they're treated as though they are doing this um, deliberately, if you like that. Oh, sorry, that should be type C. That's an error. Um, type C, use the weapons that are used against you against other people. Um, I think one of the interesting things in this, this is a hypothesis. In, it should be type C on top there, type C. Um, one of the interesting things is that I do wonder whether in type C, when we're looking at the higher C, C5 and above, whether the kids start off in the early part of the school years clearly 
unresolved around trauma modifiers perhaps. But as they move through with maturity in the school years, they organize around the trauma better than the A's. It's only a hypothesis, but I do wonder about that. To the point where sometimes it's hard to determine what's strategy and what's trauma. Children in type C are much better for user C strategy, much better at using adults to regulate their arousal. You know, they can do all sorts of things to force adults to feel something of what they feel. It may lead to explosions, but they, they go about it in a very different way to the um, children in A. Um, yeah, this is my last point. I think, I'm not sure that Crittenden wrote this or said it. I know she said it. I think it's a great quote in this. And I just wanted to finish this because I think I'll stop at this point. Um, sex, sexual, sex and kids is just... It's become a really, it's always a problem, sex. Societies always have major issues about how to regulate it, what to do about it. You know? um, but the Object Relations Analytic Brigade, of course, in the post-Freud or Freudian era, over-sexualized the child. Bowlby kind of airbrushed it all out. And we've now got to a point where we can't even really talk about it. I don't know what we do if we actually started going to podiums and started to talk about the sex lives of nine-year-olds. Um, I mean, I'm not sure they have one, except for this. This is the important bit, because what you do get are children referred in the school years for inappropriate sexual behaviour. A large, most of these kids have got comfort disorders, I think. Some have been abused sexually, but a hell of a lot haven't. I think there's reasonable evidence for that. You've got the compulsives who are starved of comfort and touch, who then have eners around looking for comfort, and this gets misinterpreted as inappropriate sexual behaviour. And I've seen kids like that being sent off to special facilities which deal with, quotes children with sexual deviant behaviours, you know. I mean, it's quite extraordinary, really. The story stems has thrown up a chunk of C5 boys, not a huge number, but enough. I mean, a significant number, actually, you know, minority, for whom comfort has failed. And for them, I think they denigrate the source of comfort, which is mothers. And if it's coupled with domestic violence, what you get is an eroticization of violence. And these boys are frightening about their aggression towards women. And I mean, it's not just aggression, it's, it's sadistic, it's hair toe curling, some of the stuff that they come up with. And a very small group at the bottom here, these are a really tiny little group, but over the years I've noticed a small group of children who have what you might call an eroticized attachment. Um, they display coquettish, flirtish behavior with their mother, parent, at the same time as they don't want to go near them. And at school, these kids are picked up with the most florid acting out, quote, sexual behavior. Some of those may have been sexually abused. It's not impossible, but um, they're just kind of an interesting group. And why bringing this up is that when you see very extreme examples of kids and extremists, you do get very clear windows into things that usually otherwise are hidden. And it's definitely clear to me that you get what we, the adults call sexual behavior in the school years when children are deprived of comfort or deceived around comfort. And it comes out in what looks like kind of sexualized behavior. And I'm gonna stop there team uh, because I think I've said far enough and I was gonna do a bit on polyvagum and stuff but we could have to do that another time thank you very much mm -hmm.